dignitaries, excellencies, industry colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum. It gives me great pleasure to stand in front of you today here and to address this distinguished uh, audience. But to start with, I must first of all thank the, the organizers, Nutshell, and specifically to my dear brother and friend, Mr. Azfar, for such an extra extraordinary uh, event, series of events throughout the years, bringing leaders uh, of Pakistan from various uh, domains to talk about one thing, which is how to make Pakistan a better place. So he's not here uh, now, hopefully he will, he will join us. Um, so I would like, first of all, to begin with explaining actually the era that we are living in. I believe that we are living in a very interesting uh, times. Um, it is an era where the boundaries between physical world and the virtual world is actually blurring, disappearing. Each one of us has two lives. We have a life in the physical world. We have our identity. We have our names. We have our behaviors. We have our network. And we also have maybe a number of identities in the uh, virtual life or a number of lives in the virtual world. So we have different maybe names, different identities, different the way that we behave in the virtual world sometimes is different than the physical world. And as we go out, uh, along in the technology advancement and the way that we see it, that boundary between the two you know, sides of the world is actually disappearing and, and becoming very much unclear where to set the boundary. And this is maybe very clear when we look at our kids and the young generation and how do they behave, which is totally different than the way we used to live. We used, you know, I used, I grew up as a kid that most of my life was basically physical. I go to school to learn. Um, I watch TV sometimes, you know, to entertain. I go and play football outside in the neighborhood. I, I sometimes go to the cinema physically. If I want to socialize, I go physically and meet people. But all of this is changing right now, if you notice, that you don't need, you still have the choice to do this physically, or you can do it virtually also. So you can go to the cinema with your friends and watch movie virtually without even moving outside of the house. You have a social network, you know, that you meet your friends virtually. You have these platforms that you can tweet, you can consume content, you can educate yourself. YouTube now is, is like a great school. Uh, you can learn so many things from that uh, platform. This phenomena, if you like, brings a lot of, I think, opportunities, and it has its own also challenges. But we will focus about, you know, the, the opportunities today. You know, what, what can we learn from this, this transition or this revolution that is happening um, and, and the fact of the digital lifestyle, it creates a lot of opportunities, as I said, and it changes the dynamics of economies of different countries. The, this was very clear, of course, during the COVID. Um, all of the sudden, you know, the state of life went from a physical kind of uh, interactions to completely uh, remote, where we were asked to carry on our you know, day-to-day -day work uh, 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 remotely. We used to, uh, even children, you know, used to attend school remotely and, and et cetera. So all of a sudden, we, we relied a lot on the virtual world. We do our shopping, we do our... 
So this is by definition, that kind of revolution or this transition, by definition, it was started in the third industrial revolution. And if you follow the previous generation of industrial revolution, you would understand that this is primarily different than the rest. Every industrial revolution, when it came, it brought with it a lot of different opportunities, you know, and, and it is up to the nations and to the countries and people to understand what are the level of opportunities that we can capture out of this revolution and prepare uh, for it. And whoever, you know, took advantage and understood this, they are becoming now a superpower or they are already uh, uh, out there. So if we analyze the Third Industrial Revolution, which was started at the 90s when the internet basically came that have changed the dynamics and the structure of doing business, you know, completely. So this was the beginning, you know, of the dot com. This was the beginning of the mobile phone era, the penetration, the broadband, the Internet. Um, this is the, um, the Microsoft. This is the Google, the search. This is the YouTube, uh, the Amazon, the e-commerce, etc. So a new concepts have been formed, which was never there uh, before. And all of this because of technology. But the interesting part that I would like to emphasize on is that there is a reason why people that took advantage of this, they are sitting in one place. It's only one nation or one geography, one area in the world that have really taken a lot of advantage of this. And we know. So Microsoft, Google, uh, Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, you know, you name it. There is a reason why, you know, the innovation just actually happened uh, uh, out there. It's in the 90s, I remember when I started my college, this was the first time that I was introduced to computers or learn how to type in a keyboard while the internet is out there, you know? And there was websites, people were designing HTML pages, people are designing e-commerce, eBay, transactions over the internet, and we were just learning how to type on a keyboard, just understanding the difference between a CPU and a memory and a RAM. So this gives you an indication that there was the education system was completely, uh, you know, disadvantaged to us. We did not have access to resources that was available out there for other nations, other countries. They took advantage of that. They understand that this a computer revolution, an internet revolution, and they knew what to do. They took advantage of this, and this is why they are today, you know, at the top of the economy, because they took advantage of that revolution. There are other nations that took advantage of this, not primarily as an innovator, but as a support nations, to support that revolution. So if we look, for example, software development, so the innovation you know, of the social media and the transformation and the founding of internet happened in one place, but we saw that there are other countries that took advantage also uh, of this. So software development, for example, India took a big advantage of that. So they started to develop their people. Uh, they don't you know, innovate or they did not find these kind of big platforms and giant platforms, but they supported these giant platforms. So they started to outsource. Uh, China, for example, benefited uh, from this a lot. So they started to assemble devices, build, for example, you know, screens, chips, uh, uh, etc. Korea have taken a big advantage of this also, the Samsung story, the chipset manufacturing, and, and etc. So there were, you know, few countries or economies that really have also realized that this is a new revolution, that it has a lot of potential and opportunity, and they manage to put their self into the map of this uh, revolution. The, we are living now in a fourth one, which is another revolution. It's called the fourth industrial revolution. And by definition, it's again, 
it's an evolution of technology, so it's a continuation of technology. And remember the phenomena or the concept that I talk about, the, the boundaries between physical world and the virtual world? It is actually going to be even more difficult in the fourth industrial revolution. And if you don't believe me, just try to put some of those VR headsets and you know, start to engage with this application. Try to play a game and then you will start to realize that it is really very difficult for you that is this real or this is, you know, I am still in the physical world or what should I do? So it's, it mess with your brain. But this is a revolution that it's going to also create a lot of opportunities for so many people. It, it depends on how you really understand this and how do you position yourself to capture you know, value out of this new transformation. So if we miss the revolution of the past, then there is no reason that we miss this, which is what the, the era that we are living in. The beauty of that is that, or the, the advantage that we have and, and the difference between you know, the third industrial revolution and, and how did it start and the limited resources that we have. So our education system was, you know, was not uh, fully designed in order to see that something like this was happening. And beside that, the whole world was a bit scattered. Unlike today, the globalization, I mean, the world now became much more closer than any time before. So meaning, that resources, which is basically the, the information, you know, technology, the resources uh, to learn, to get yourself educated, is available out there. Unlike, you know, before the era of internet was access to information and knowledge was very difficult. You have to go to school or you have to go to college or maybe you have to travel outside of your country now. It's completely different. Now, there is no boundaries between, you know, when it comes to educate yourself and getting the knowledge that, that you need. And we believe in Pakistan that it's a nation that could take a big advantage of that. Why I'm saying that? As I said, the world now is completely different than where it used to be. So there is no limit to access to information, to resources that you could equip yourself to take advantage of this new industrial revolution. We have a youth, you know, population. We have 62%, that's the latest, I think, statistic that I have, is a youth population, and youth plays a major role in driving, uh, you know, uh, uh, economies. And the youth understand this very well, better than anybody. So it's not an aging population that belongs to a different era. No, th those people, they are, they are living. They are, a lot of them, they are actually digital native. They born this way. They born with that kind of concept. They understand it uh, uh, very well. We have the fifth largest or most populous you know, population in the world. And 62%, as I said, um, they are uh, youth. English language also, it's, uh, it helps in Pakistan because it's a very strong, you know, second language spoken. So that also add to the advantage that this nation uh, uh, has. So, so all what it requires now is that we envision that this is, if this is the future and this is the revolution and these are the opportunities, we need to now position ourselves and take advantage and, and do the fundamental things, putting that vision in front uh, uh, of us. But before, you know, we, we think about going there and before actually pursuing that journey. And we heard today uh, from the finance ministers and, and the different ministers and the, the, the government officials that there is a lot of positive signs from stabilizing the, the economy. Um, and the, I like what the word that uh, the Minister of Finance, he said that the IMF is not the end goal. It is just a cure. It's like an injection to cure you, you know, it's like a painkiller, but it's not going to solve your problem. 
So while we're stabilizing the economy, but it is important that we know which direction we want to go and what are the steps that we should take in order to pursue that journey. So I would like, you know, to, and, and by the way, this is uh, also something that I want to, to mention on the sidelines, is that the story of Emirates Airline, you know, when I talk to anybody, my colleagues, my friends about, and I tell them that Emirates Airlines started from Pakistan, nobody actually believes that this is the case. So, and, and there is, uh, I don't know, maybe some of you know, but there is a lot of you, maybe they don't know. Uh, every Emirates, if you notice, every Emirates flight starts with EK, which is Emirates to Karachi. That's the first uh, trip. And there's a lot of people that they don't know that this was the case. So Pakistan at one point of time was a destination where things were happening. Karachi was also a capital in the region, at least where there was a lot of things that's happening. I know a lot of people from our nation that used to buy homes in Karachi for tourism, for destination, for business and, and for etc. So it's not the case that we are just starting. No, Pakistan was there on the map at one point of time. We have deviated, unfortunately, from that track, but it's never too late. We can bring it back again, as I said, with the right vision and the right direction and to fix few things that we have, you know, in our um, economy and our policies and our... So, you know, representing the private sector and, and from the technology uh, also uh, uh, sector, there are a lot of fundamental things. So if we talk about the opportunity is the fourth industrial revolution, which all about technology. We need to fix our technology here, first of all. We need to build the right infrastructure. Before we actually pursuing that journey, first of all, we have to enable Pakistan to be on the map of a digital uh, nation. And if I look at the numbers today, unfortunately, when we talk about fiber penetration, how many homes are connected with broadband, with fiber, it's a single digit. It's like five, six percent of the homes are connected with, with fiber. And when we look at the mobile broadband, for example, although we are happy you know, that we are saying we have 4G and, and et cetera, but when we look at the numbers, this is a big country, we are still hovering around 50% mobile broadband penetration, which is 4G. That means there is more than 100 million people are still without broadband. And it all starts from there. If we equip the nation, first of all, of the necessary infrastructure and the, te the technical uh, you know, uh, infrastructure or the technology, the broadband primarily, then you could uh, you know, see and, and pursue that journey that we are talking about to go to that uh, uh, direction. And there are fundamental reasons why this is the case, why we lack you know, from our technology. So there is a lot of policies that needs to be corrected. It needs to encourage investing in technical or technology inf infrastructure. We need to turn around the situation. We need to accelerate our um, technology infrastructure. We need to enable the country with better uh, uh, network and, and, and much more broadband access to the uh, to the uh, uh, people. There, as I said, there is uh, a lot of things that needs to be uh, uh, done. Of course, I'm not going to talk about, you know, the details of what do we need to do, but there are so many discussion is happening now with policy makers, with government officials in order to change the, the situation um, of, of the and, and the, the, the other important thing is that while, you know, we, we put that vision in, um, in our mind and that this is the journey that we need to go to, we need also to understand that we create an environment in Pakistan where we attract foreign uh, investors. We were successful at one point of time. We brought a lot of, you know, big tech companies to Pakistan. Uh, but unfortunately, there is a number of them, they actually are leaving. 
they're packing their bags and, and some of them are thinking also of exiting and this is not healthy. I think we need to reverse it. We need to fix, as I said, the, the, the infrastructure part. We need to change some of the policies, some of the other. We need to create that balance between you know, the, the, the businesses that are here, that create, um, uh, they are in this sector, the technology sector. We need to create that balance between the, the, uh, the, um, the private sector and the consumers. And this is sometimes, for example, if I talk from a telecommunication point of view, this is, is pretty much imbalance. Why I say that? We are, I think, the cheapest country uh, when it comes to telecommunication or broadband product uh, uh, offering. This is maybe good for some people, of course, that's the cheapest you know, country that we offer abroad. So uh, if I give you, for example, uh, our broadband, we measure it by ARPU, the average revenue per user per month. So it, 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 per month, we earn around 300 rupees. That's the best on, on average. That's like three cups of tea per month for an individual. So this is, you know, the irony thing that we build all of this infrastructure and towers and we put the network into other. And sometimes when electricity goes out, we have to put fuel to make it up and running. We have call centers, we have this. And our product that we sell for a month, it costs three cups of teas. So this is the imbalance that I'm talking about. And this is where we need the intervention of the policymakers, of the government, is that to create that balance. To, if we could achieve this, then as a private sector, we could help the government and help Pakistan to pursue this journey, being part of the fourth industrial revolution and put the country into the map of the, the digital uh, economy. I think my time, they are telling me my time is, is over. Uh, again, I am very optimistic that this country will turn around. And I hope that this will, will, uh, will be done uh, uh, very uh, quickly. At the end, I would like to thank again the organizer for putting this uh, uh, event together. And I wish you a successful uh, uh, event for the next two days. Thank you very much.